Good evening, everyone. Welcome out to our final Awanas of the school year. We are standing all over the building. One, two, three. Let's talk about Jesus. The King of Kings is He. The Lord of Lords supreme throughout eternity. The great I am, the way, the truth, the life, the door. Let's talk about Jesus more and more. Father, we thank you for giving us a wonderful school year and Awana's year. We ask you to bless the celebrations and the fun this evening. We ask you to give us a good time up here in the sanctuary as well. In Christ's name, amen. Facing our flags, American flag. Ready, pledge. I pledge. Christian flag, ready, pledge. I pledge allegiance to the Christian flag and to the Savior for whose kingdom it stands. One Savior, crucified, risen, and coming again with life and liberty for all who believe. Grab your Bibles. Ready, pledge. I pledge. You'll excuse us as the pastor's Bible shoots out of his hand and almost right. takes out the cubbies. Cubbies, you can leave. TNT, you can head on out. Standing, we'll sing when the roll is called up yonder. We'll do all three verses tonight. That's hymn number 55. When the roll is called up yonder. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more. And the morning breaks eternal, bright and fair. When the saved of earth shall gather over on the other shore. And the roll is called up yonder. Let's remain standing for prayer. I got several requests I want to give you tonight. 
A couple of them we already put out, of course, pray, continue to pray for Amy Meeks, successful surgery she had yesterday. She's home doing well. Obviously, we don't have a baby yet. Jesse, Lord willing, goes Monday to be induced. I was picking with her a little bit in the back about, are we sure for Monday? She's looking like the baby's got to come out. Amen. On, so pray for her. Pray for Josh. Amen. <laughs> uh, pray also, if you would, for Brother Larry Biggs. We just got word uh, today he's got to go for some surgery on Friday. Brother Frank remains in the hospital at the VA uh, with his heart issue. Lift him up in prayer. And we also found out yesterday one of our long-term missionaries, Brother L.T. Fry, uh, is in critical condition in ICU with uh, some significant health issues. Please pray for Brother L.T. if you would. Remember services tonight as well. Let's pray. Lord, we are glad to be in your house, and we say thank you for the opportunity that you've given us just to come and worship you on this Wednesday night. Again, thank you for a wonderful Awana year that we've had. We're looking forward to our summer celebration series. But Lord, we ask that you would bless tonight's message as well. Those that uh, we've mentioned via prayer requests, we ask that you touch, heal. Lord, we pray a special blessing upon our services tonight. We'll love you and praise you in Christ's name. Amen. You can be seated. Come on, Brother Scott. seen a ruined lives, millions bound by sin. I have seen those in the ghetto with a bottle in their hand. Yet I know this could be me. I could be in that same place, but I'm washed and I thank God for grace, unworthy of mercy, yet I'm free and saved, unworthy of royal blood that flows through my veins, if God for Calvary God's grace, 
Thank you, Brother Scott. Let's all stand together one more time. We'll sing Victory in Jesus tonight. The first and the last verse, hymn number 243, Victory in Jesus. tonight please church Jeremiah chapter number 32 this evening Jeremiah chapter number 32 couple of quick reminders this Sunday as a reminder we'll take up a special offering to support our upcoming teen conference in just a few weeks so that we can uh, give them some good meals while we are uh, worshiping down in Durham so please help us out with that if you would that's coming up in June for the teen conference And then a reminder that we have one more Wednesday night. We'll have a regular Wednesday night service next week. Awana ends tonight. We'll have a one regular Wednesday night service. We'll, of course, have nursery. Uh, And then the following Wednesday night will be our first Wednesday in June. And we'll transition to our summer celebration series. We'll have the men here upstairs in the middle. Ladies will be downstairs. Uh, James and Anna will have the kids upstairs. Uh, And then around 7.45, we will dismiss and head downstairs each evening for a good time of fellowship. We're sure looking forward to that. As was the case last year, we will not be live streaming those services. So keep that in mind if you would. Jeremiah chapter 32, we are bringing to a close tonight uh, the the four-month series that we've done, three, four months now, on prison experiences of the Bible. Let me one final time refresh your memory of the individuals that we've looked at. We started off looking at Joseph, talking about his experience from the pit to the prison that led him to the palace. We talked about John the Baptist, Samson, Jonah, Peter. We talked about Paul and Silas. We talked about Job. And then last week, we started, and I gave you the introduction and point number one 
of a message that I'm going to conclude tonight that I'm calling the prison of God's purposes, the prison of his purposes. And I, 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 I talked at length, I won't go through all of it again, but I want to refresh your memory about of all the prison experiences that we will look at, Jeremiah's is, is really the most challenging. Because of the circumstances of Jeremiah's life, we'll refresh your memory on that in just a second. And because on the surface, it is just hard to read the book of Jeremiah. A reminder, Jeremiah started preaching when he was about 20 years of age. And scripture tells us that he preached for some 40 plus years and never saw a single convert, never had anyone uh, come to know the Lord as a result of his preaching, fell on deaf ears. And because of his preaching, he ended up in prison uh, for, a, for a very long time. Again, historical context, 10 northern tribes of Israel have already been conquered by the Assyrian uh, uh, Empire, the first empire that was 738 BC that would take over the 10 northern tribes. So Jeremiah is preaching to the southern kingdom, to those two tribes of Judah and Benjamin. The southern kingdom was called Judah, and his message was one of judgment. And that's one of the reasons it's hard to read the book of Jeremiah, because for 32 chapters, he says the first 32 chapters are all about judgments coming, judgments coming, get right, judgments coming, and sure enough, everything he talks about and prophesies comes to fruition. When chapter 32 opens, the message changes because it's no longer judgment is coming, the message is now judgment's here. Because what has happened in these th uh, a couple of years that the book of Jeremiah transpires, the Assyrian Empire has been overtaken by the Babylonian Empire. And King Nebuchadnezzar has risen in power. The Assyrian Empire has been overtaken, and they are descending now. They are making their way down to the southern empire of Judah, the southern kingdom. And Jeremiah literally, almost by opening the curtain, you can see here comes uh, the, the, the Babylonians. Here comes Nebuchadnezzar. We read all about that in Daniel when Nebuchadnezzar comes and takes out the three Hebrew children, takes out Daniel and other uh, intelligent rulers of the day. So, so these two books parallel each other. Jeremiah happens just a couple of years before the book of Daniel. And interestingly, I mentioned to you, when you read chapter number 32, and, Je and Jeremiah is, is saying again, judgment's coming, judgment's coming, you might think it would be King Nebuchadnezzar or the enemy that would put Jeremiah in prison, but it's not. It's the king of Judah. It's the king of Judah who looks at Jeremiah and says, I've heard enough. I don't want to hear anything else out of you. I'm going to shut you up. I'm going to throw you in prison. And I can't help but wonder if Jeremiah, perhaps much like Joseph, the first character that we talked about, looked around at his circumstances, looked around at his surroundings, looked around at what he was facing, realizing that he'd been preaching now for some 25 years, 30 years almost at this point, ends up in prison, nothing has been accomplished, it would seem, in his mind, and thinks to himself, why am I here? Can I just say to all of us, church, one of the things that I hope you have gotten out of this, one of the things I hope you have seen out of it, is that all of us will go through these things, whether we call them prisons, storms, trials, circumstances, we'll go through these moments of life where you look around and you think to yourself, what God is doing right now does not make sense to me. We're going to look at a lot of verses tonight, so I'm going to ask you to bear with us as we unpack some things. I gave you one point last week which was that these prison experiences can be a place of confusion. We talked at length about how Jeremiah had life's challenges, had circumstances, was not allowed to marry. God told him not to marry. God told him he would be alone for his entire life. God told him he would never have children. Things that were difficult for anybody to experience, Jeremiah had to go through that. His own family abandoned him. He gets into some very, very tough situations, and ultimately he ends up in prison for being God's man. It would be easy to think that at that moment, Jeremiah's world was over. But in fact, God reveals something to Jeremiah. Hear me, church. Listen now. God reveals something to Jeremiah in prison that he would never have experienced except for the fact he was in prison. Can I say that again? God had to get Jeremiah to this point so that he could show him what he's about to do next. 
So for those of you who are taking notes, number two, point number two, I'm only going to give you two points tonight. We gave you number one. The prison can be a place of confusion. Point number two, the prison can also be a place of commitment. A place of commitment. Even though, hear me, Jeremiah was in a difficult place, it is very inspiring to watch how he conducted himself. You'll remember last week we ended with this really weird story of how even while he's in prison, his cousin comes up to him in prison and says, there's some land here, and you're, according to the law, the Redeemer, you're going to have to pay up if you want it. And this is land, by the way, that's getting ready to be overtaken by the Babylonians. You know, if I'm Jeremiah, I'm like, I'm keeping my money, buddy. You're not getting it. But that's not what God said. So let's look, if you would, please. Let's begin reading tonight at verse number 16 of chapter number 32. Everybody found it? Say amen. All right, lots of reading, so I want you to bear with me. I'm going to read rather quickly because I want to get to a lot of Scripture tonight. Verse number 16. Now, when I had delivered the evidence of the purchase under Barak the son of Neariah, the purchase there is that whole redeemed land. You can read about it. Verse number 13, 14, 15. I prayed unto the Lord, saying, Ah, Lord God. Now, I want you to note what he says, church. Thou hast made the heaven and the earth. By thy great power and stretched out arm, and would you, can we, can we read this last clause together? One, two, three. And there is nothing too hard for thee. Can we just stop there and just say amen for about 30 minutes? In the midst of a situation that makes no sense, humanly speaking, in the midst of his own prison experience, Jeremiah turns starts to pray, and if I may paraphrase, his prayer is simply, man, God, you're amazing. There is nothing too hard for thee. The next several verses extrapolate on that same theme. Note, if you would, verse 17. Ah, Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth. By thy great power and stretched out arm, there is nothing too hard for thee. Thou showest loving kindness unto thousands and recompenseth the iniquity of the fathers unto the bosom of the children after them. The great, the mighty God, the Lord of hosts is his name. Does this sound like somebody who's miserable to you? Verse number 19, great is great in counsel, mighty in work, for thine eyes are open upon all the ways of the sons of men to give everyone according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings, which has set signs and wonders in the land of Egypt, even unto this day, and in Israel, and among other men, and has made thee a name as at this day, has brought forth thy people Israel out of the land of Egypt with signs and with wonders and strong hand and with a stretched out arm and with great terror, has given them this land which thou didst swear unto their fathers to give them, a land flowing with milk and honey. They came in and possessed it, but they obeyed not thy voice, neither walked in thy thy law. They have done nothing of all that thou commandest them to do. Therefore, thou hast caused all this evil to come upon them. Behold the mounts. They are coming to the city to take it. The city is in the hand of the Chaldeans. Chaldea was the capital city of Babylon. So sometimes you'll hear them referred to as the Babylonians. The Chaldeans means the exact same thing. The fight against it because of the sword of the famine of the pestilence of what thou hast spoken is come to pass. Behold, thou seest it. And thou hast said unto me, O Lord God, buy thee the field for money and take witnesses for the city is given into the hand of the Chaldeans. I want you to note when I said number two tonight that the prison can be a place of commitment. In this moment, Jeremiah is experiencing what it's like to be in a very dark place but have sweet communion with his God. This is a theme that I hope you have seen has manifest over and over in these prison moments. It's in these dark places that we often find we draw closest to God. It's in these dark moments 
that we experience the communion of God. And in so doing, Jeremiah starts off by praising God for his greatness. One of the great themes of this whole uh, series has been these prison experiences. No greater example than Paul and Silas who at midnight they prayed and sang him. We see how Joseph uh, was praising God in the prison. We see how Samson even though he was there because of his own sins uh, had a prayer session with God over and over and over. Uh, you see how these prison moments draw us closer to God. N nearly 30 years of preaching this is what I've learned folks. When folks endure hard times, trials, prisons, storms, tribulations, one of two things have happened. One of two things happens. They either run from God like Cain did, or they run to God like Job did. May I say to you, church, the direct, hear me, very often the direction in which we run is the direction in which we were leaning before the prison moment came. Not only is it a place of communion, it's also a place of confidence. Back to your scripture. I'm going to read fast. Stay with me because God is about to reveal something to Jeremiah. Everybody listen. Everybody listen. God is about to reveal something to Jeremiah that he does not reveal to any other prophet. There were other prophets who saw the captivity coming. There were other prophets that God allowed to see the judgment of Assyria in the north, the subsequent assumption of Babylon throughout the entire territory. Other prophets were allowed to see that, but God is getting ready to show Jeremiah something that nobody else saw. Notice, if you would, please, verse 26. Reading quickly, stay with me. Then came the word of the Lord unto Jeremiah, saying, Behold, I am the Lord. The God of all flesh, is there anything too hard for me? Therefore, thus saith the Lord, behold, I will give this city into the hand of the Chaldeans, into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, he shall take it. And the Chaldeans that fight against this city shall come and set fire on this city and burn it with the houses upon whose roofs they have offered incense unto Baal and poured out drink offerings unto other gods to provoke me to anger. For the children of Israel and the children of Judah have only done evil before me from their youth. For the children of Israel have only provoked me to anger. The works of their hands, saith the Lord. And we can keep reading. The next several verses, God says to Jeremiah something that he'd said to several other prophets, which is, because Israel and Judah did these things, judgment's coming. But Here's what he also said to Jeremiah. Go, if you would, please, to verse number 36. Now, let's go to verse 35 so I can give you kind of the end of that section. They that built the high places of Baal, which are in the valley of the son of Hymnon, to cause their sons and daughters to pass through the fire of Moloch, which I commanded them not, neither came into my mind, and they should do this abomination to cause Judah to sin. If you have a reference Bible, you may see now in front of verse number 35, there's a backwards P. That lets you know that this is a new thought, a new paragraph, if you will. We're going in a different direction. Here's the part that Jeremiah alone is allowed to see. And now, therefore, thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel concerning this city, whereof you say it shall be delivered into the hand of the king of Babylon by the sword, by the famine, by the pestilence. Look at verse 37. Behold, I will gather them out of all countries, whither I have driven them in mine anger and in my fury and in great wrath, and I will bring them again unto this place, and I will cause them to dwell safely. Multiple prophets had said judgment's coming. God had revealed that over and over. But to Jeremiah, 
and only because he's in prison, God says, I'm going to bring them all back together. He says, if you'll allow me to paraphrase, it's going to get bad. Judgment is coming. The place is going to be set ablaze. In fact, for 70 years, the Israelites will be in captivity, but I'm going to bring them home. I'm going to bring them back. Notice, if you would, verse number 38. And they shall be my people, and I will be their God. And I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever for the good of them and of their children after them. I will make an everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn away from them to do them good, but I will put my fear in their hearts that they shall not depart from me. Yea, I will rejoice over them to do them good. I will plant them in the land assuredly with my whole heart and with my whole soul. For thus saith the Lord, like as I brought all of this great evil upon this people, so will I bring upon them all the good that I've promised them. I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm, hitting, I'm trying to hit this point home with you because what God is telling Jeremiah is it's going to get really bad. But he says to Jeremiah, trust me, I know what I'm doing. Trust me. I've already got the end in mind. I've got it under control. I'm sovereign. I know, Jeremiah, that you don't understand this. This doesn't make sense to you, but just trust me, I got it. Can I, can I just pause a moment and, and, and do something that one of my seminary professors used to say all the time, never do, which is to make the pulpit a confessional? This is the part of the, um, don't throw your Bibles or look at me with chastising judgment. This is the part of the Christian life that I still struggle with. This is the part of the Christian life. I I don't want you to think I don't have, I have tons of faith. Because I've seen God do the miraculous. But I still struggle at times when I can't make sense of it in my head. My wife will tell you. When, 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 when situations arise, when problems arise, I'm not an emotional reactor. I don't, if it's a problem at work, if it's a problem at church, or a problem with the kid, I, I don't react emotionally. But I'll say all the time, I, got, I, got, I, need, I need to think about this. I need to think through, she's grunting over here. Mm-hmm. I need to think through this. Because for me, and my mind operates, I need to figure out how to maneuver my way or the church's way or the college. I need to figure out how we maneuver our way in best position, and I got to figure it out. And it's hard for me to look heavenward and say, God, you figure it out. That's my personal challenge. There are times that, Renee, will wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning, and I'm laying there wide awake, and She'll say, what's wrong? And I'll say, I'm just laying here fretting. I'm just, I'm just thinking. I got this issue, and I'm thinking about the worst case scenarios, and this could happen, and that could happen, and what am I going to do if this happens? And, 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 and I have this ongoing argument in my mind because over and over and over, God has proven to me he can handle it. He's proven to me he's got it under control. He's proven to me that my worst case scenario mind thoughts are foolish, but that's where my head goes. I've told you on many occasions. Put your bookmarker right where I've got it. Turn with me to Philippians real quickly. Turn with me to Philippians. Because this is kind of the self-talk I have to engage in every once in a while. Turn with me to Philippians, chapter number 3. Chapter number 3. I've, I've told you on many, many occasions that my life's verse is Isaiah 118. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord, though your sins be as scarlet, they should be white as snow, they be really like crimson, they should be as wool. Nobody ever asked me to sign a Bible. Greg Hodges, Isaiah 118. Favorite verse of the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 9, 27. I keep under my body, bring this objection, unless by any means I preach to others, I myself should be a castaway. Favorite verse of the New Testament. But this is the passage where I find myself having to go to all too often. 
Because when I get consumed with my own oh my gosh thoughts, I'm reminded that this is not a new tactic. The enemy's been operating this way for eons. And Paul addresses it. He says to the Philippian church in chapter number four, verse four. Everybody there? Rejoice always in the Lord. And again, I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Look at verse five, six. Be, y'all read it with me. Make me feel good. Verse six. Be careful for nothing. You know what that means? Don't worry about it. The word careful does not mean like when we're saying to somebody, they say, I love you, I'm going home, and we say, be careful, it's getting dark, there are deer out. That's not what it means. When it says be careful here, what Paul says is don't let worries consume you. And that's what happens to me. I let the what ifs take over and it starts, y'all looking at me like y'all are so holy and righteous and spiritual. I know y'all don't deal with any of it. Y'all just forgive the preacher. I, the, the, the what ifs can be overwhelming and I have to make myself go to this. Be careful for nothing. Everything in prayer and supplication and thanksgiving. Let your requests be known unto God and the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. But look at verse eight. Finally, brethren. Whatsoever things are, what's that word, church? Whatsoever things are, whatsoever things are, whatsoever things are, whatsoever things are, whatsoever things are of, if there be any, if there be any, say these four words with me, think on these things. Think on these things. Things. In other words, for all of us, when we get consumed by the worst case scenarios, when our mind starts to run away with us, when the enemy wants to say to you, uh, here's all the things that could happen, God has already told us what to do. Uh, fill our minds. I'm a big believer in the doctrine of replacement. Get rid of the junk, fill it with the good, and start thinking about how God has already shown over and over and over he can handle it, and he's not going to fall apart now. Go back to your text. Number one this evening, the prison can be a place of confusion. Number two, a place of commitment. And finally, number three, the prison can also be, a, this is going to sound like a strange statement, prison can be a place of comfort. Chapter 33, we are not going to read it all. I encourage you to go home and do it. Chapter 33, God really reveals even greater detail what's getting to, ready to happen. And when you read it, you can see it's, it's, it's ugly. The judgment that Israel, excuse me, Judah, southern kingdom, Israel's already been judged, southern kingdom of Judah is getting ready to face, it's ugly. And it's justified. Let me just read it. A couple of verses, look at verse 1. We'll hit a couple of them quickly. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the second time, while it was yet shut up in the court of the prison, saying, Thus saith the Lord, the maker thereof, the Lord that formed it, established it, the Lord is his name. Look at verse 4. For thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the house of the city, concerning the house of the kings of Judah, which are thrown down by the mounts, by the sword, they come to fight with the Chaldeans, but it is to fill them with the dead bodies of men. I've slain in my anger and in my fury, and for all whose wickedness I have hid my face from this city. And again, the more you read, the more, the more that, 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 that God reveals to Jeremiah, something begins to take shape. Everybody hear me? It's the reason I called the message this title. Jeremiah is here on purpose. God put Jeremiah here, removed from everywhere else, removed from that Judaic society, removed from the people that would not listen to him to begin with, put him here in this prison, listen, so that God could have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with him and show Jeremiah something 
that he could not show anybody else. You know what's astounding, folks? Again, reminding myself, we serve a sovereign God who has an eternal plan, and it's all under control. You ever, again, don't judge me, you ever watch the news and think, this country has lost its ever-loving mind? You ever? Yeah, I mean, just... Every day, I mean, we, Renee and I, I was meeting, I had meetings this morning with the, with the governor, and Renee and I are driving home from Richmond today, and we're listening to a couple things on the news, and I'm thinking to myself, we are just loony in this country. But we serve a God who's got it all under control, and who ain't surprised by any of it. And there are times when I want to punch my fist through the television, but God's in control. Amen. Comforted by his providence. Comforted by his presence. You know what astounded me in reading this? I've read it a hundred times and never noticed it. In chapter 32, it says, and the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Where was Jeremiah, church? In prison. Chapter 33, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah a second time. And lest you forget... It says in verse 1, he's still in prison. And if you get halfway through, it says the word of the Lord came to him yet again while he's in prison. You know what that says to me? That even in your darkest moments, God's there. God's there. Even when you are looking around and saying, I don't get any of this. I don't understand any of this. God's there. How did Jeremiah become a man of such faith? He has the reputation of being the weeping prophet. You unpack that a little bit. Almost, folks almost talk, think he, he's a little whiny. He wasn't a whiny prophet. He was the weeping prophet because he was so in despair for the judgment of the country that he loved. I get it. I understand it. He was so passionate about the destruction that he saw coming, and he was pleading with the two tribes of Judah to not be this direction, to turn their backs. And so, yes, he would cry, and he would weep, and he would beg, and he would preach, all to no avail. How did he maintain his faith? How do you go for 40 years and everybody laugh at you? How do you go for 40 years, no family? Remember, he wasn't allowed to get married? Wasn't allowed to have children? All by himself? The king hates him? Leaders hate him? I mean, there's never been a more clear picture of somebody who was by himself through... How do you sustain that? That answer comes one more place. Jeremiah chapter 15. Turn with me please to Jeremiah chapter 15. And look at verse 15. Two verses tonight and we're done. Look at verse 15. You have a reference Bible. It tells you just above this that Jeremiah is communing or talking with God. Verse 15. Oh, Lord, thou knowest. Boy, we could just stop there, couldn't we? Oh, Lord, thou knowest. Remember me and visit me. Revenge me of my persecutors. Take me not away in thy long suffering. Know that for thy sake I have suffered rebuke. And look at verse 16. Man, star this verse, church, if you're writing your Bible. Thy words were found, and I did eat them. And thy word unto me was unto me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. For I am called by thy name, O Lord of hosts, O Lord of hosts. When I 
walked in, you can close your Bibles. When I walked into church tonight, I stuff I needed to do back in the office, took care of that, phone calls needed to make, and checked the answer machine, did all the stuff I needed to do, everyone, do that every Wednesday night. And then I, haul, I, I, I heard my, my, one of my grandchildren, I heard, I, heard, I heard Josie, so I knew that Nick and Lydia are here. So I come out, and I speak to them, and chat with Lydia a little bit, how's your day? Everything good at work? Everything okay? Need anything? Walk in here, and I, and I saw James, and James, day's last day of school, yep. Excited? Yep, absolutely. How many days you got? What, what you doing next? Everything good? You need anything? You know why? Because they're mine. Now, don't take offense. I didn't ask that of everybody. But I asked that of mine. Because I want to make sure they're okay. That's what Jeremiah is saying. Lord, even in the midst of this, you're concerned about me. You know why? Because I'm called by thy Let's stand to our feet. <clears throat> These prison moments can be tough. But man, God is good and he's sovereign. Let's pray. Father, we love you tonight. And thankful for the opportunity that we've had these last several weeks to walk through these prison experiences of these characters in Scripture. Lord, it's easy to get caught up in the difficulties of the experience and forget to find the lessons, the sweet things that are found in these dark places. Lord, it's my prayer that everyone that's here tonight, as they walk through these valleys, these difficult moments, these tough times, these prisons, these storms, whatever metaphor we use, our mind will go back to this reality that you're sovereign you're good, and you've got it. Bless us now as we depart. Bring us back this weekend, excited to worship you on the Lord's day. Well, thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You are dismissed. Thank you for being here tonight. God bless you, church. We love you.